My father was Russian and a free thinker. When I was a boy in Belfast, I used to think he was getting something for nothing. Maybe he was at that. He left me many dictums which still run around my head. One in particular remains an echo. If you have to work for someone else, be the foreman. I fulfilled that dream for him fairly early on. At the age of 16, I became the youngest civilian foreman employed by the Royal Army Service Corps. It happened during the closing stages of the Second World War. I was in a group of labourers working on a base supply depot in Finichy, on the outskirts of Belfast. The depot was well away from the barracks, and as far as we civilians were concerned, it consisted of four large warehouses and a wooden hut. The hut was for us to eat our dinner in, use for shelter, or occasionally brew up. Every chance we had, we brewed up. There were 16 of us, divided into four quartets. Each foursome was under the command of an NCO. We four were a right mixture. There was Aloysius Brewster, a great big hulk of a man in his thirties who'd missed his vacation. He should have been a strong man in a circus. For a tanner bet, he ran two lengths of the warehouse, over 200 yards, with a 200-weight sack of dried peas on his back. After he'd won the sixpence, he held out his hand with a result in shilling and said he'd do the same run with two sacks. Now, I was convinced that this was utterly impossible and quickly covered the bet. With the others, I helped to put the first sack on his shoulders. Somehow, I was pushed to the rear when the second sack was loaded and watched in disbelief as Brewster won my shilling easily. Months later, Donahue told me the second sack contained only feathers. Given that Brewster was the magwitch of our group, Donahue must have been the artful dodger. He was a dart of a man. If he stood five feet, that was giving him the best of it. It was said he'd been a notable bantamweight boxer. But by the summer of 1944, he was a wizened little man who looked as though a strong wind would flatten him. Gillespie was our remaining member. Completely illiterate, he stared silently out at the world like some latter-day Buster Keaton. It was whispered he'd close connections with the black market. Our duties were dully routine. Apart from the dried peas, we handled boxes of bully beef, cases of canned beans, that sort of thing. Nothing perishable. We were perennially confined to barracks, as it were. One Monday morning, in the middle of that summer, the rhythm of our routine skipped a dramatic beat. We left the base. We were loaded, all 16 of us, onto two lorries and taken to the Belfast Ice and Cold Storage Company in Great Victoria Street. Second Lieutenant Winterbottom and Sergeant McKenzie were in charge. Mackenzie we knew well. A nice enough man from the heart of Midlothian who rarely cracked a smile. Winterbottom was a new officer to us and judging by the gleaming pip on his shoulder, a freshly minted one at that. We were issued with rubber mats. Donahue said, sotto voce, What do we do now? Kneel and pray? Not sotto voce enough, however. Lieutenant Winterbottom piped up. No, Donahue, I'm not asking you to kneel and pray, though I dare say it wouldn't do any harm. He glanced at the sergeant and waited for a reaction which never came. Then, as though tiring of a joke that no one else could see, he said, You explain it to the Sarge. Mackenzie cleared his throat. <clears throat> you hold it up. So, he held a rubber mat in front of him. And you swing it. So, he threw it round him like a cape, and the mat settled neatly on his back. And you tie it round the neck. So. There were two pieces of cord attached to the mat. When Mackenzie had finished, Donahue said, Hey, Sarge, you've got your bib on back to front. We all laughed, but Mackenzie remained unamused. You're going to need these when the sun comes up. Mark my words. He was right. We formed a single line queue into the massive refrigerators and emerged with sacks of frozen offal on our backs. The queue slowed to a crawl as we loaded the lorries. The heat of the mid-morning sun had its effect. The sacks thawed rapidly, and despite the protective mats, a thin liquid coursed its way inside collars and down our backs. Soaking wet, we returned to the base at dinner time. We had our pieces outside in an effort to dry out. Donahue was most indignant, and unexpectedly eloquent. It's an insult to the dignity of humanity, a flaming outrage. He went on in this vein for some time and ended up saying, What we want is a flaming protest meeting to appoint a spokesman. A spokesman for what? This is from a baffled Brewster. Dirty money. Dirty money. Aye, dirty money. Penny and our dirty money. That's a rule. Is it? Oh, aye. 
You do work like we did this morning, and it's a penny in our dirty money for the whole week, so what we need as a spokesman. I was elected, all of 16 years old with a fresh open face. Perhaps that's why I was picked. There was a shortage of fresh open faces amongst us. Also, I'd spent two years at the Belfast Tech. Our crew considered that as good as Oxbridge. The same day, I stood nervously at the desk of Second Lieutenant Winterbottom. Yes, Maxwell. Uh, well, sir, I'm representing the men regarding dirty money. I beg your pardon? Uh, dirty money, sir. I see you. <laughs> well, actually, I don't see you. Are we paying you with filthy ten-shilling notes? He laughed. I didn't. Uh, no, sir, it's the blood. Whose blood? The, the blood from the awful, sir. Awful? I explained what had happened in about the penny and our dirty money. He lit a capstan full strength and inhaled deeply. He must have had the lungs of an elephant. Well, it's a bloody job, isn't it? He laughed. I laughed. Representing the workers was no easy job. Still, it turned out to be a job well done. A week later, we all got the four bob rise. The men didn't actually chair me all the way from the paymaster's office, but during the weeks that followed, I would find the odd packet of ten woodbines or a 2D bar of rare round trees chocolate stuck into the pocket of my dungarees. There was no doubt I was the hero of the hour. Well, hero of the month, as it turned out. Exactly four weeks later, a 72-pound box of bully beef went A-W-O-L, as Donahue euphemistically put it. We were all questioned, of course, but the box remained missing. The following day, after I'd brewed up and eaten my piece, I decided to have a lie down behind our shed. I was soon drowsy with the heat of the sun, and the hum of summer insects was like a lullaby. Psst! Psst! It was an anxious-looking Donahue. What's the matter? Ah, uh, listen, your man Brewster and I need a hand. I was immediately suspicious. What with? Never mind what with. The thing is, we had a business transaction going, but there's been a wee hitch with our transport arrangements. What do you mean? That Git Gillespie couldn't get any petrol. I don't know what you're talking about. The bully beef. Now I knew what he was talking about. We knocked it, and we can't get it away. So? So we've got to put it back. Well, where do I come in? You go out, out, into the main road. Stop the traffic coming up by the side of our shed. How? Simple. He disappeared round the side of the shed and came back with a red stop sign on a pole. I was a most uneasy accomplice. There was little road traffic in those wartime days, but I had to hold up a convoy of army tanks for a good five minutes. Later, when we convened in the hut, I expected to be confronted with a jubilant Donahue. Instead, he was most indignant. That's a crying shame. It's exploitation of the masses, that's what it is, he explained. When we were hauling back the, um, the you-know-what, we had to heave it through a hedge, and like it was overgrown with weeds and things. And I flaming near broke a leg against a flaming rock, except it wasn't a rock. It was a... You'll never guess. I thought about it. Gold, I said. It might very well be agreed Donahue triumphantly. That's a boundary stone. Brewster was incredulous. A boundary stone? Made of gold? Donahue turned to me. Listen, we've been working here how long? About uh, five months, I said. Well, what's that in weeks? Um, 22. That's 22 multiplied by 48 at one and fitness farthing an hour, one and sixpence farthing, I corrected. Agreed, but that penny is for dirty money. We're entitled to another wing, city rate. We're inside the city boundary. You see, that boundary stone could be gold. He looked at me with gleaming dark eyes, and I felt like a hypnotised stoat. We'll hold the meeting tonight and elect a spokesman. But, I said, I got no further. We'll elect you, said Donahue. Once again, I nervously went to see the now full lieutenant Winterbottom. And once again we received a penny in our rise, plus what to all of us was a small fortune in back pay. If I was the man of the month before, I now became the man of the year. The fags came in packets of twenty, the chocolate bars weighed in at four ounces. As the autumn leaves fell, my star rose to its zenith. And as those same autumn leaves were falling, some faraway brass had decided that the seventh base supply depot could exist with less military personnel. Lieutenant Winterbottom sent for me. Uh, Sarge McKenzie's been posted, and I have to appoint a charge hand for the number four shed. You'll be in charge of the other three. Me, sir? 
Yes, you, Maxwell. I realize you're a little young, but Gillespie can't fill out the timesheets, and Brewster and Donahue don't possess unblemished records. In fact, their records are quite blemished. But, but, sir, I... I took a straw poll among the men. Your appointment will be quite popular. In fact, they seem very keen on it. You'll have the title of foreman, and you will receive an extra penny per hour. My mind was reeling. One and eightpence farthing an hour? Foreman! My father's words were resounding like a joyous bell in my head. I started my duties the following Monday. Sergeant Mackenzie had occupied a partitioned prefabricated office in the corner of the shed, and now it was mine. There was a small War Department desk in the corner and a chair. I sat in one and read the official OHMS memo on the other. It was short and cryptic. Inspection of shed number four today, 11 a.m., ensure corned beef correctly stacked. I went out into the shed. None of my staff, if you'll pardon the expression, was to be seen. I crossed to the stacks of bully beef. They were all straight and well seated with one exception. And what an exception. It must have been built by someone cockeyed or drunk or both. It bore a passing resemblance to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I called out the names of Brewster, Donahue and Gillespie. It sounded like an announcement for a music hall act. I went over to the hut. The music hall act was there with cans of tea and the Daily Herald opened at the racing page. I coughed. Ah, uh, fellas, I said. What do you want? asked Brewster. I, I want you to come over and restack the bully beef. Is that an order? Um, well, well, yes. Y yes, it is. He lumbered over to me. One moment I was staring up into his face and the next looking down at the top of his head. He'd lifted me by the bib of my dungarees and I was a good two feet clear of the ground. My shirt was so tight across the throat I couldn't speak. I didn't need to. Brewster said enough for both of us. That's the last flamin' order you give us, he said. If you want any beef stacked, you can stack it yourself. I stacked it myself. A back-breaking job on one's own. For the next few days, I did several back-breaking jobs on my own. After that first week as foreman, Donahue took me aside. Now, listen, young fella. You're the foreman, isn't that right? Yes. And you're on one and eightpence farthing an hour? Aye, yes. Well, he scratched an unshaven chin. We don't think it's fair that you should have the glory and the money. Do you see what I mean? I saw what he meant. We split my extra penny an hour four ways, and I never gave another order. After all, my father would never have wanted me to be the hardest working foreman in the world.